Welcome to our daily devotions this morning. I'm sorry that the cupboard was bare yesterday, but we had a little bit of a mix up with our scheduling. Anyway, we're back on board and uh, today we're going to be looking at chapter 11 of Matthew. Before we read the passage, though, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a new day. Thank you for life and health and strength. Thank you that even though outwardly we may be wasting away, inwardly we can be renewed day by day by your grace at work in us. So please graciously speak to us and renew us now as we read and meditate on your word, the sword of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first 15 verses of Matthew's chapter 11 give us a fascinating insight into John the Baptist and what Jesus thinks of him. But we're going to pick up the chapter from verse 16. Let me read. To what can I compare this generation? Jesus speaking. They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the times in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been for performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me share with you Nicky Gumbel's thoughts on these verses, again from his commentary, The Bible in One Year. The teaching of Jesus is fascinating. In the first section of today's passage, he seems to be saying, you can't win. On the one hand, John the Baptist was an ascetic and was accused of being demon possessed. On the other hand, Jesus went to parties and all kinds of people, uh, with all kinds of people, and made friends with those who were regarded as unsavoury characters. He was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Verse 18. Whatever we do, we may be misrepresented. Yet Jesus says, Wisdom is proved right by her actions. Verse 19. All we can do 
is the right thing and not worry about what anybody else thinks. Opinion polls don't count for much at the end of the day, really, do they? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Jesus then goes on to denounce the cities that he has visited and performed miracles in, where people have neither repented nor believed. He, he suggests that their sin is worse than the sin of Sodom. The sin of unbelief is perhaps the most serious of all. Jesus goes on to teach in such a way that it's clear he believed in both predestination, that God has already determined everything that will happen, and free will. He teaches both uh, along both alongside one another. It's a paradox. The two seemingly contradictory things are both true at the same time. It's not 50% predestination and 50% free will. Jesus says we are 100% predestined and we have 100% free will. This may seem impossible, but God is able to transcend and yet not distort human freedom. We see this ultimately in the Incarnation. Jesus is 100% God and 100% human. He is fully God and fully human. With regards to destination, Jesus says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Why God chooses to reveal himself to some and not to others is a mystery. It is certainly not based on wisdom and learning. Sometimes the great intellectuals simply cannot see it. Jesus praises his Father for having hidden these things from the wise and learned. And yet sometimes people of little or no education or those who are very young, little children, verse 25, seem to have a very profound understanding of Jesus. The message translation puts it like this. You've concealed your way from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spell them out clearly to ordinary people. So predestination is one side of the coin. On the other, you've got free will. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Verse 28. The invitation to come to Jesus is for everyone. No one is excluded. We're all invited. We all have a choice whether to accept the invitation of Jesus or to refuse it. Now, it's difficult to get our minds around this paradox. Nicky Gumbel uses the following illustration to help. Imagine a room with an arched doorway. The outside of the arch is inscribed with the words, Come to me, all you. Everyone is invited into the room. When you get into the room, on the inside of the same arch is written, No one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. In other words, Free will is a doctrine for everyone. No one can say, I'm not going to become a Christian because I have not been chosen. The invitation is to all. On the other hand, predestination is a doctrine of assurance for those who are Christians. Once you've accepted the invitation and entered, you can know that God has chosen you and therefore he will not let you go. In a stressful world where so many are wearied and burdened, 
How good is it that Jesus promises us rest? He offers to take our burdens and replace them with his own. The yoke, something which Jesus would have made in his own carpenter's workshop, was a wooden frame joining two animals, usually oxen, at the neck enabling them to pull a plow or wagon together. The function of the yoke is to make burdens easier to carry. And so we have this image of walking in step with Jesus. This image of Jesus sharing our burdens, making the trials to be endured and the battles to be faced easy and light by comparison if we were on our own. Jesus is not a slave driver. When you pursue his agenda for your life, you carry a burden, but it's no, it's not harsh or hard, sharp or pressing, but comfortable, gracious and pleasant. Verse 30. When you do what Jesus asks you to do, he gives you the strength and wisdom to do it and you carry his burden with him. Now there will of course be many challenges and difficulties, but there will also be a lightness and ease that we wouldn't otherwise have. Jesus says to us, are you tired? worn out, perhaps burned out with religion, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. I'll show you how to, to walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you know what it is to be wearied and burdened. We come to you today and we give our burdens to you. Help us to learn from you and grant us rest for our souls so that in everything we do, we can serve you freely and lightly. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. I hope you have a great day and may God bless you.